So I think it's time for another Q&A with me. So today I'm going to go through some of the comments and questions I've seen on my channel and discuss them with you today. Hey guys, Liz from The Nail Hub here and I was just going through my feed on YouTube and I cannot believe it's been like five months since I started this Nail Fundamentals channel. Well, Nail Fundamentals playlist inside of The Nail Hub channel. Um, but I really want to thank you guys for giving me consistent feedback, always commenting on my videos, asking questions. It's really amazing to be able to interact with all of you. And so today I figured, you know what, I think we're due for another Q&A session. So I'm going to go through some of the comments also as well this time instead of just questions and try and give you guys feedback on some of the things that I've seen come through on my community feed over the last few weeks. Okay, so let's start with this really nice comment from Lisa Donnelly. She said, Liz, I'd like to thank you so much for doing such in-depth tutorials online. You helped so many people like myself who did classes but didn't feel like I got enough knowledge from them in order to be confident enough with my work to pursue nails as a career. With these videos, it's amazing because we can constantly refresh ourselves to make sure we are doing nails in the correct way. I love how you, I love how much you specify how important your prep work is and also the health and safety surrounding doing nails as I found not everyone everywhere focuses on how important this is. I love your videos and I look forward to seeing more. Thank you so much, Lisa. That's really awesome. I mean, honestly, the whole reason why I did this Nail Fundamentals playlist inside of my channel is because I started seeing, you know, even... I've taught a bunch of classes in person and I'm constantly working at trade shows and I work with a bunch of products and I know a bunch of people in the industry and every time I'd come across people, they just, it seemed like even within the professional community, not even taking into consideration clients and DIYers, even within the professional community, it seems like there's a real lack of quality education. And again, you know, if you've ever listened to my podcast, I, I do have several opinions on the way that our licensing program works here in the United States and the, the lack of education and how really I don't think that state-run schools are the best kind of incentivized method to get people prepared for their careers. But anyway, long story short, I've seen a huge need in my industry for people to be able to get information that they, they desire. And also because you can't always fly from, you know, Europe to the United States to take a class or from Florida to, uh, you know, Idaho to take a class. I mean, taking classes is expensive. Having to travel for classes is expensive. And although I constantly travel and I constantly do classes and I constantly take classes, it is a huge investment. And I know a lot of nail techs also struggle with their financial models and their businesses, and they literally do not have two dimes to rub together a lot of the time because they're overspending on product or they're undercharging on their services. And we'll get into that a lot later on this channel because I have done a lot of, you know, of that t discussion on my podcast. If you ever listen to my Nail Hub podcast on, uh, on, on iTunes, um, I do talk about finances a lot, but I really see a huge deficit in education and in preparation for all levels of nail lovers. And that's exactly why I did this Nail Fundamentals playlist. So is it perfect? No. And I know some of you out there watching my videos are like, screw you, Liz. I can't believe you're doing this on YouTube for free and all of that. But this isn't really about, you know, putting other people in, you know, down or, or me being perfect or any of that stuff. It's really just about me sharing what I see, what I know is not out there, what I know has not been taught properly, and also sharing some of the experience that I have over the last six years of me doing nails. Almost this year, it'll be seven. Um, I, I just want to share that knowledge and that expertise because I feel like if I can get people to be better prepared for their nail careers, or if I can, if I can really inspire a DIYer to be able to go from DIY into doing nails as a career because they love it so much, I mean, what's better than being able to do what you love for work? Or if I can help a client be better prepared to look for what is a good salon and what isn't a good salon, then my job here is done because that is what my whole goal is for this channel is to really elevate all parties involved in the industry that we love to really help people be more prepared and better educated. And it's gonna really help our industry thrive. I mean, there's a lot of protectionist people inside the industry that are like, no, 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 we shouldn't share information. I can't believe you're putting this stuff out there. You know, I can't believe you're doing this. You're betraying the professional industry. But I don't see it as a betrayal. I really see it as opening up those doors, welcoming people in, giving people education, sharing everything, 
And honestly, the only thing that can come out of that is people really elevating is is you know more money coming into the industry more professionals entering the industry more awesome products being invented more ideas more growth more e evolution and so that is awesome to hear that you know there's lots of you guys out there that write positive things on my channel thank you lisa for writing that to me and i do really read every single comment i get on my youtube channel it means a lot to hear you know all of your feedback whether it's positive whether it's negative whatever i like reading it all so thank you so much for taking the time to write me comments if you've written a comment to me below and if you have wanted to write me a comment but you're like oh no that's dumb i won't ask that or no like she doesn't need to hear that no please do like there is literally no dumb question i love reading everything i love trying to respond to everything so please 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 continue to comment i love it okay so keep it up all right so let's see what else is on here all right, so another really cool comment that I got that's less of a question and more of a, of a feedback thing on one of my videos. This is from my gel overlay uh, video that I did. It is from Moody Tool and it says, I just did a backfill on my nails yesterday. I used all the information from last week's lesson. I didn't understand how to use the reflection lines on the gel until last week. What a difference in my nails when I let the gel do its work and watch the reflection lines. And what she means is the line of light that I discussed in my video about using the reflection to see whether or not your gel is smooth. My finish filing was so much less and easier, not having divots to deal with. Also the slip layer and then the mohawk of gel, that was so cool. I guess I didn't really understand self-leveling until last week's lesson. It only took me an hour and a half to do each hand. I have been spending up to four hours for each hand with breaks. I was doing one hand a day. Yesterday I did one hand in the morning and the other in the afternoon. This time I also added IBX to my infill and it's still, it was only one and a half hours. Thank you, Liz, for all you've taught me. Soon, I might even post a picture. I'm a real perfectionist, so I'm not really comfortable with putting my work out there. I've gotten compliments, but I still see all the flaws. I can't wait to learn even more. See you next week. That's so awesome. It really is gratifying to me to have people learn something that I share and be able to put it to use and experience a positive result. So I am so happy that that worked for you. And I really encourage you guys to practice what you see here on my channel. The only way you're going to put this to use, all of this information I'm putting out there, is to practice, ask me questions, continue to follow these videos in sequence because I am going through things in a relative order of you know how we're going to add different elements as we go along. So I'm really glad that this worked for you, Moody, and um, I can't wait to see what else you're able to achieve as you continue to watch these videos. Here's another good one. This is a great question. Hi Liz, I noticed you were hand filing the nails going in back and forth direction and this is also from my gel overlay video. I have always understood that it's best to file natural nails in one direction so the natural nail is not shredded. Is it because there's an overlay on the nails which allows you to file in both directions? All right, so Michelle, this is a really good question. And yes, uh, you will notice that I do file the nail in both directions, which means I go back and forth on the nail as I'm filing. I don't file on one and then file into a point. Number one is um, the, the filing kind of into the center or filing straight across in one line. I would say that that really is only for natural nails when you're leaving them natural. And this really comes from, I mean, I even remember my grandmother teaching me this when I was younger about how to do my manicure. And she would always file her nails into the center, one side first and then the other, and they would always file into the center. And she would tell me it helped her nails not chip and not peel. And there is a reason to that. So if we were to look at our nails, they are layers of material. And if we're going back and forth, it can actually separate those layers and make them more prone to peeling. However, once you get into doing things like gel, the whole nail is really encapsulated and protected by the gel on top. And also, if you are filing at more of a 45 degree angle, so if, like, if this is the nail and I file at more of a 45 degree angle like this, I'm not going to be going so perpendicular that I'm also shredding the top of the nail. I'm gonna be undercutting the nail, which allows that natural nail to be more smooth, also thinner underneath the artificial product and I don't have to worry about filing in one direction or filing into the center of the nail. So yes, that is absolutely a valid point, but I would say that that really only applies when you're doing full on regular nails, like basic, basic, basic natural nail care. Um, and it also doesn't apply to everyone. Some nails like are really affected by that, some nails aren't. It also depends on the way that your nail layers seal together. The other thing that I wanted to add to that is if you're doing IBX treatments, you're also gonna notice that your nail plate doesn't get shredded by filing back and forth. 
um, because the nail plates, the nail plate layers are sealed together. And it also lastly depends on the type of nail file that you're using. So if you're doing natural nail care, you're going to want to use a very high grit file, like a 600 grit file, or, you know, I would say 240 is the minimum for natural nails. If you're trying to do like really nice, smooth, natural nail care, 240 grit is probably the lowest number I would go with. But once you get into doing artificial products and all of that, it kind of all goes out the window. So that's um, a, an answer to your question, Michelle. Hope that helps. Okay, so a lot of you also have been asking me about what speed I use on my e-file. And every time I use my e-file, I try to actually tell you what speed I'm using for specific things. Um, if I don't, then um, the basic rule is if I'm doing a removal or if I'm filing on product, I usually do use my e-file at full speed. So my e-file uh, has a maximum of 20,000 RPMs. And if you remember from my e-file basics video, I talked about how RPMs are not the end all be all. So definitely go back and watch that video if you haven't watched it. Um, but my particular machine goes up to 20,000 RPMs. So when I am filing on product or I'm trying to remove product, I use an extremely light touch, but I do use my full speed on my machine. When I'm doing anything other than that, if I'm working on natural nails, if I'm working on cuticles, if I'm working on something that's delicate, if I'm working around the cuticle area on product that it's very thin, I will actually slow that down to somewhere between maybe five and 7,000 RPMs or somewhere around the 7,000 RPM range. Um, so I really want you guys to understand that the reason why I use my e-file at full speed is because it allows my bit to glide over the surface, okay? So especially when we're using bits that have very deep flutes in them or those, um, those big teeth on them, flutes are, are the professional term for the teeth that are on carbide bits. And again, you can see this on my eFile Basics video as well as the bits that I use throughout my past several videos. Um, it allows my bit to glide over the surface and shave the product off without a lot of vibration, without a lot of heat, and I don't have to use pressure. So that's why I like to use full speed. A lot of you guys were like, oh my God, I can't believe you're using full speed on your eFile. But again, it's really about how much pressure you're using and the type of bit that you're using and the area that you're working on. So that is the, the answer for you guys on that. Um, Ashley Schmidt asked, what are the best type of brushes for certain things? Example, do you use round, square, or oval for sculpting gel? Which type would you use to apply color? So Ashley, this is completely preference, and I did reply to Ashley on my channel, but I wanted to put this out there because I think this is a good question. Um, there are lots of different sizes and shapes of brushes, and once you get into gel brushes, um, the two main types are oval, which is like a cat tongue uh, is what they call it, and then also a flat. And you can see this, I have a gel brushes video from uh, earlier in my nail fundamentals playlist. Um, and I go through the different types of brushes, different types of hair, all of that stuff. So it really comes down to preference. Some people love big brushes. Some people love smaller brushes. Some people love flat. Some people love round. I will tell you one thing is that I typically use a flat brush, which means it's squared on the end. I like to use those for the types of clients that have more of a squared cuticle area. So some people have a very nice oval area around their nail plate. Some people have more of a square shape, especially like on thumbs, we tend to have more of a square shape. And also on toes, we tend to have more of a square shape to our cuticle area. So using a squared or a flat brush allows me to put that right up against that cuticle area and make that nice clean application without having to try very hard. Sometimes trying to fit an oval brush into a square opening is a little bit more uh, difficult. So totally comes down to personal preference, but I do like to use flat brushes if the, if the cuticle area is more of a squared off shape. Another question that I've gotten from several of you, and I think this also goes back to some of the people like skipping around on my videos, which is totally fine. Um, if you have not started my fundamentals playlist from the beginning, and this is the first video you're watching, go back to the beginning because it's gonna make so much more sense. If you watch everything in sequence and you're able to see everything as I go along, I explain all of these fundamental things, but I think this is a good question. I'm gonna review it again. Um, so Lindsay Ingle says, do you cleanse the nail after you finish file before polishing? Okay, so I've gotten this question on both ends and I'll, I'll answer this one first and then I'll do the other one too. All right, so if you watch my gel nail overlay video, I showed you how to finish file the overlay before you put the color on to make sure that the nails are smooth. And again, by using the line of light or the reflection and checking your work as you're going along, sometimes you can eliminate finish filing altogether. But for those of you that are just starting to do this, I know for a fact you're gonna have to finish file your nails, which means that after you apply the artificial product, so after you apply that protective overlay of gel, 
it's going to be a little bit lumpy and it might be a little bit thick in areas. So you're going to go and you're going to clean the nail to get rid of this tacky inhibition layer. And then you're going to use your file or your e-file to smooth out the surface of that overlay. And the same thing happens with artificial nails as well. Sometimes when we apply the product, it's not perfectly smooth. So we need to shape the product and we need to smooth the product as well. So that's what we call finish filing is when you're smoothing and polishing and sculpting the product by removing product in certain areas and make sure it's nice nicely shaped and smooth. Um, so after you're done finish filing, you're going to have this rough artificial product on your nails. You're going to have clear gel or pink gel, whatever you used um, as far as your builder. And then there's going to be dust everywhere. And so this question is about, do you need to cleanse the nail? Which means, do you need to use your gel cleanser to cleanse that, that nail before you put the color on? Now, I typically do not cleanse the nails again. Reason why is because I don't want the nails wet. I want them to go right into color application. So I typically just dust off the nail. Now, if you are in a salon, um, there's typically two types of brushes that are extremely common for dusting off nails. Oh, here it is. So there's like the fluffy kind of dust brushes and then there's like the manicure style dust brushes. I like using these in a professional setting because I can sanitize these. A lot of states, and I don't, I don't know all the rules throughout the world, but a lot of places do not like these to be used in a salon because they can't really be cleaned. So you're basically touching a lot of different people's fingers. You're never really cleaning this. And I have been to some salons where these fluffy brushes are disgusting. It looks like they've been used for five years on all kinds of different stuff and they're just caked with crap. So. These fluffy brushes aren't as professional. You can get away with using them in a private setting at home, on friends and family, whatever. Or, you know, if you can find them cheap enough, hell, you could gift them to people or use it once and give it to the client. I don't know, whatever floats your boat. But the typical way to do it is use a manicure style brush. So like these ones have like a little handle on them. Um, I don't have, I think I broke my last one that had the other handle. They're like the kind that has like a handle and like this square part on it. So these ones are nice to use on clients or, um, or in any real setting because you can sanitize them and you can put them in your quat solution and sanitize them. Okay. So that's, um, that's typically what I do, but I don't use gel cleanser. Um, I don't make the nails wet again. I just dust off all the dust and then I go straight in with my color application and that typically takes care of everything. Um, the other reason why I don't want to cleanse the nails after I'm done finish filing is if you're using a wipe, uh, then you're going to get fuzz on the artificial nail because the, na the, the nail has texture from you finish filing it. You're going to get fuzz, even if it's lint free wipes, you're going to get fuzz on the nail. And then when you go to apply your color, you're going to have fuzz in your color and fuzz is the devil when it comes to gel. You do not want fuzz anywhere near a gel. So I like to use scrubby brushes. You can also put a little bit of cleanser on your scrub brush. Like you can pump it on there if you want to, or spritz it on and then scrub the nails through, but you're going to have to wait a few minutes to make sure that those nails are completely dry before you put color on the nail. So I typically do not cleanse the nails before I put the color on an artificial product. Okay. I go straight in. Um, so I don't want the nail wet. And also there's no, like, we're not talking about natural nail, right? The, the main reason why we cleanse the nail is one, to remove bacteria and oil and two, to uh, take off inhibition layer when we're working with gel. Those are really the two main reasons why we're, why we're cleansing nails with gel cleanser, which is rubbing alcohol and typically a little bit of acetone in there, um, depending on the brand that you buy, or, you know, some people use just plain old 91% uh, rubbing alcohol, whatever you want. Um, but, I like to use my gel cleanser that has a little bit of acetone in it, which does help with the drying process and also with uh, stripping oil. Um, but those are really the main, main reasons why we do gel cleanser is to take off bacteria and oils from the natural nail before we apply products and also to take off the inhibition layer after we're done curing a gel. So once we're working on artificial product, there's no more issue with inhibition layer. There's no more issue with bacteria being on the natural nail or getting uh, capped inside. So there's really no issue with having to clean the nails again, unless your client, the only time I would do it is if my client like picks up their hand, like touches their face, they get makeup on their nails or something like that, where it's oily, then I will clean the nails before I put color just to make sure that my color adheres to the product underneath. So I hope that makes sense, Lindsay. Um, but that's, that's absolutely why I don't cleanse the nail. I just dust it off after I'm done finish filing. 
One of the other common questions I get on my YouTube channel is about product specific questions. A lot of people will write to me, like a lot of you guys are writing to me saying, hey, I use this, this, and this, you know, do you think I need to use this product? Do you think I need to use this product? Um, I will always defer back to the manufacturer. So if you're telling me you use IBD Builder Gel and you're wondering if you should use their bonder, contact the manufacturer. It's really important that you ask the manufacturer. They are the only person that can tell you whether or not something is gonna work with their product. And I wish I knew how every single product under the sun worked, but there's so many lines out there. I mean, honestly, I don't think I would ever be able to memorize every single product line and every single product that they have in it and how, which order they're used in. And some of them get really confusing. It's like, they're like, you know, you use product A7, then C3, then this, then that. And I'm just like, I don't know. So I have used a bunch of gels and really it all boils down to the same things, which is we're talking about preparation, we're talking about prep agents like bonders and primers, base coats, whatever, which are all of those first layer products that go on the natural nail. Then we've got our builders, we've got our colors, and then we've got our top coats, our finishing products, okay? So really it all boils down to the same generic groups or categories of products, but each formula is different. So each company has a different formula. And that's why it's really important that you ask the manufacturer about those questions about their products, because they're the ones that know their formula. They're the ones that know what works and what doesn't with it. And I do know some of the ones I have experimented a lot. I mean, I think I've tried probably like 50 different gel brands and, you know, I've tried lots of different things and I've taken lots of different classes, but it's impossible for me to promise that it's going to work for you. And there's a lot of variables when it comes down to gels. I mean, you're talking about the way that you prep and what you're using and the cuticle remover you're using and the, all the stuff that you're applying and how you're applying it and the lamp you're carrying it in and, and you know, what cleanser you're using and this and that. And there's a lot of variables. That's why I always recommend because there are so many variables that can affect the outcome of your gel services. I always recommend keep it simple. You know, like they say, keep it simple, stupid. I don't like the stupid part at the end of that, but I do like the saying of keep it simple because the more you mix and match, the more you're like, does this work with that? And I'm going to use this. I'm going to use that and blah, blah, blah. It's like, now you've got so many variables. How the heck do you know what's working and what isn't? So keep it as simple as possible. I try to do my best on my channel to recommend the things that I know absolutely work. And that's my goal for you guys is to really just keep that simplified process as much as possible. That's why I say like, you know, don't use 50 different prep agents. Don't use, you know, primer and bonder and this and that and this and that and this to get this stuff to stick. If the stuff's not sticking, it probably means it's not curing, it's a bad product or your prep is wrong. Um, and again, I'm not saying like deviate from what the manufacturer tells you to do. If you're using one complete system and it says use product A, then B, then C, stick with the plan. But when you're mixing and matching, I just feel like a lot of nail techs a lot of nail techs I come across um, just use so many products. I have no idea how the heck they know what's working and what doesn't. And it's almost like they're doing nails blindfolded and just hoping that it comes out okay. Um, a lot of the problems with gel, acrylic, anything with nails can be solved by breaking it all down, keeping it simple, demystifying everything, and really simplifying the process. If you can get away with just base, color and top coat or base builder color and top coat, you're going to be so much better off than using 50 different things on that nail and not knowing what's working and what isn't. Okay. So I hope that helps. Um, I also have several clients out there, just people that like to go get their nails done and are looking for good nail technicians that ask me, how do I find good nail technicians? They watch my videos and they're like, Hey, you know, you're so precise in your work. You absolutely understand what you're doing. How do I find a nail tech that's just like you? And I know that there are some of you out there that are nail technicians that are watching my videos and you're getting better at what you're doing and you're really working hard and why not be able to find those clients? So um, one thing is I'm working on a project to be able to match people who watch my videos with clients who want to find people that know how to do nails really well. But for those of you that are out there that are clients looking for someone today to do your nails, the biggest recommendation I have is number one, take a look at their social media. Take a look at the pictures that the nail tech is posting and look at their work up close. Look at how the skin looks and the nails look and all of that stuff. Really look at that. Then I recommend calling 
and asking the nail tech a few questions about the products that they use. Um, you can even, you know, discuss some of the methods that I've shown here on my channel and ask the person, you know, how do you do nails or what type of nails do you do? Asking questions is a great way to shop around for nail technicians. But number three is give people the benefit of the doubt. You know, if you've seen their work on social media, you've asked questions, you've made an appointment, go in and try them once. If they, you know, if they don't do a good job, if they hurt you, if they cut you, then obviously it's not the place for you. Um, and also another thing that is really important for you clients out there to understand is that nail technicians like me do not come cheap, okay? So that is one thing that I have noticed inside the client community is that clients are absolutely fed up with bad nail services. And I know some of you have paid top dollar and still been disappointed and I am not saying that that's okay. But a lot of you are out there getting your nails done at bargain bin nail salons and expecting amazing world-class results and it's just not possible. There is no way that a professional nail tech can provide professional product that's good for you and have the education and the constant, you know, taking classes and continuing education and the investment in her education as a nail technician or in his education as a nail technician. There is no way that they can provide awesome products, be well educated and be experts in their craft with awesome equipment and everything if they don't charge the price that they need to charge. So don't expect to get amazing nails for 20 bucks. Honestly, to give you guys a ballpark number, most of my clients when I was working full time paid me upwards of $100 to get their nails done. And that's because I was able to give them everything that I had promised. I was able to give them amazing results, amazing product, consistently healthy nails, you know, amazing experience with getting their nails done every single time. I am one of those people that really, really prides myself in my professionalism when I'm providing services. I don't typically wear funky t-shirts while I'm working. I'm usually dressed to the nines. I really like to give my clients that experience, but my, my clients also need to understand that in order to get that full experience, that full package and the results they're looking for, I have to charge accordingly. I have to charge what I need to charge to pay for my business and also be able to pay myself. And that is where it comes down to. So. I absolutely know that some of you out there are saying, Liz, I've gone to the good places. I've paid top dollar. I've paid a hundred and something dollars for my nails and it was still crap. And I feel you on that because there is a lack of education in this industry. But I want you to understand that there is a way to shop around, which is look at their social media, ask questions, visit them once and see how it goes, see what the experience is like and see what kind of service you get. Um, and also, you know, referrals on social media is great. Like take a look at their reviews, take a look at their Yelp reviews, take a look at their Google reviews, ask people in your neighborhood where they get their nails done. Or if you, you know, in next time you're in your town and you're getting coffee and you see someone with amazing nails, ask them where they get their nails done. Um, that's a great way to find good nail technicians. But at the end of the day, don't be surprised when you find a good nail tech and they're like three times as expensive as what you're probably used to paying. That's just my FYI out there. Um, and that's just because it's impossible to provide that level of awesome service without charging accordingly. It's just, it, that doesn't work. Those bargain bin prices do not match up with high quality because even just the product alone that we use, we have to charge to be able to cover those expenses. So that's part of it. All right. Um, Oh, I had another awesome comment that I'm so glad this person shared this because this is not something that I have shared on my channel. And again, I'm so used to doing things my way that I love when people provide feedback because it really allows me to see, you know, different sides of how other people are doing things. Um, and I have seen this before. It's just when you're in the zone and you're thinking about like the way you want to explain something, you might not explain it as if you were someone else. I always explain things as if it's me, right? So Layla Robinson, who Layla, thank you for always commenting on my channel. She's definitely like an avid follower. And I love that you're always commenting and providing feedback and positive feedback and just awesomeness. So thank you, Layla, for being a part of my channel. Um, so Layla says, I know I'm commenting a lot. When we nail techs are using gel to finish the nail, we can dab the oil on the nail when using a cuticle, when using a brush on cuticle oil and then rub it into the skin to keep from contaminating our oil. This isn't possible with regular nail polish though. This is such a good point. So if you remember from me talking about cuticle oil, I love this cuticle oil. It's daddy oil. It's my all time favorite cuticle oil. I just, I smear all over everything. I just love it. And it smells really nice. It's not overpowering. Um, it's got really nice ingredients in it and it's made by a company called Famous Name. So this I have on my website. I just love this stuff. But as you notice, this one comes with a brush inside. It also comes with a dropper. But sometimes when you buy smaller bottles of cuticle oil, it only comes with a brush inside. 
And so Layla is right. You can absolutely put the oil here on the nail after you're done working on the nail and then rub it into the skin. That way you're not touching the skin to the brush inside of your cuticle oil. I was talking about just putting it up above the finger and letting drops fall or using a dropper so that you're not actually making contact with the finger. But since we're done you know, cleaning the nail after we do our top coat, we clean the nail with alcohol, you can absolutely, like Layla, Layla says, touch the brush down on the actual nail surface and then rub that in with your fingers or your gloved hands up into the skin and that way you're not contaminating your cuticle oil. So thank you so much for pointing that out, Layla. You're absolutely right. And I'm glad that you shared that little tip with everyone because that is something that you can do if you only own cuticle oil with a brush or if the one that you love comes with a brush. So really good point. And then lastly, I know some of you have been watching my gel removal videos when I soaked off gel polish, and a lot of you have been saying, hey, my gel polish isn't that easy to soak off, um, I'm having issues getting my gel off, or you've been wearing an overlay and then you decide you wanna soak everything off and you're having a hard time getting your gel off. So number one is make sure that your gel is actually soak off. There are a lot of builder gels out there. Most builder gels are hard gel and cannot be soaked off with acetone. And I know a lot of people when they're new to gel, they don't take into consideration that some formulas are hard gel and some formulas are soak off. So make sure that you're only putting soak off on your nails if you want the ability to soak off your gel. Or you have to put soak off gel on the natural nail and then you can put hard gel layers up above that and e-file down to that soak off. But if you're looking for something that you can soak off, then you're going to need soak off gel, not hard gel. So make sure you pay attention to the product that you're buying. Number two is the longer you wear gel on your nails, the harder it is to take off. So if you have a gel polish manicure that you leave on your nails for six weeks, it's gonna be that much more difficult to remove the gel once you go to soak it off, okay? So um, I would recommend that if you're looking to keep overlays on your nails, or if you're looking to have product on your nail for long periods of time, like you're someone who wants to have gel polish manicures every four weeks, or that's what you're doing on your clients, then I would recommend you do the overlay method rather than the soak off method. The soak off method is fine, but now that we're evolving with gels, a lot of the gels in the beginning were hybrid. They're like a mix between nail polish and gel. They soak off really easily, like literally in three seconds they soak off. But now we're getting to the point where gels have evolved so much that they are, there's just so many different varieties. And if you like long wearing products, like if you wanna be able to get your nails done every month instead of every two weeks, then you're gonna to need to kind of upgrade from the hybrid gels into like the real gels. And it can be soak off, it can be hard gel. But if you're looking to keep your nails on for four weeks at a time, why soak them off? You know what I mean? Like why not just do the overlay method, backfill them and put new color on and call it a day. Um, and you're gonna be removing that old product as you're shaving your nails down. I mean, a lot of clients, they like to keep their nails the same length. So as your nail grows out, you're gonna shave it down. And as it grows out, you're gonna shave it down. So you're constantly adding new products and removing old products. So I recommend if you're looking to keep your nails on that long, just leave them on and just do the backfill method um, instead of constantly soaking off the product and going through the effort. Because I know some of you were writing to me saying, it took me an hour to soak off my gel after having it on my fingers for you know six weeks or four weeks or whatever it is. Or I've had an overlay on my nails, but now I decided to soak it off and it took me like an hour to even get the, the gel to budge. And that's because the longer you have the gel on your nails, the harder it is to remove. It just really, really is like concrete on there, which is awesome if you like to keep gel on your nails, but if you're trying to soak it off, it's gonna be a little bit of a problem. The other thing that actually adds to that is if you're using a lot of uh, primer, whether it's acid primer or non-acid primer with your gel applications, especially those new like non-acid primers that are you know like supposed to be like protein bond and bonder and this and that bonder and whatever, the more bonder you use, the more difficult it is going to be to remove your gel polish to soak off the product. So keep that in mind as well, that if you're looking for more of a short term uh, longevity, then you're going to want to eliminate some of those bonding agents so that the gel actually is able to lift off of your nail plate. And the longer that you have the gel in your nails, the, the harder it's going to be to remove, period. Um, but I really like the overlay method. I find that if you are someone who, like for example, when we dye our hair, I always use the analogy of dyeing our hair. I dye my hair um, and I, I like to tint my roots just because you know I'm, I'm starting to get gray hair and um, I love my gray hair but I don't, I don't like it to be so drastic so I like to kind of tint it with, uh, with demi-permanent hair color. Um, and I often use this analogy because it's like when we dye our hair, whether it's permanent, semi-permanent, demi-permanent, whatever, when we go to touch up our roots, 
we don't take all the color out from this part of our hair. We just add to it, right? It's the same process with nails. I don't know why we got so fixated on removing everything. Um, I think it comes from like the nail polish days when like you did remove nail polish and then you put a new color on. But a lot of people are so fixated on taking everything off and all it does is damage the nail every time that you do that. Just like if we were to remove the color every time we dyed our hair just to put new color on, we would have like no hair left. Like my hair would be complete straw breaking off. There's no way, like you just cannot do that. So think about it like a root touch up, right? I mean, that's essentially what we're doing. If you like to maintain the same process every single time, like I like to maintain this color of my hair and I always do the same thing, then you're gonna use the same process. And that's the same thing with gel polish. If you like having your nails done all the time, then instead of soaking off and doing that kind of temporary application or temporary process, think about in a long-term process and think about how you can really protect your nails just like you would your hair, but be able to keep updating and maintaining that service that you like to have. So it's really about maintaining the service, not about restarting every single time that you go get your nails done. I hope that makes sense, okay? And again, there's a lot of things that go into that, like making sure that there's no lifting, making sure there's no problems, all of that stuff, just like anything. But I really think that a lot of clients and a lot of nail techs don't think this way. They just kind of go with the put it on, take it off, put it on, take it off, and pretty soon the nails are way thin, you can't really do anything with them. So if you know that your client, or if you as the client like to have your nails done all the time, maybe you should start thinking about having more long-term services and maintaining them rather than doing the short-term stuff and risking damaging your nails over time, okay? All right. So that's it for today, guys. I hope all of these uh, answers helped you. Again, I really appreciate hearing from all of you. It makes me feel so awesome to know that this playlist is helping people. And if it's not helping, you know, by all means, comment below. But I love hearing all the love and all the comments and all the questions. There is no dumb question. I'm gonna tell you right now, there is no dumb question. Please feel free to comment below any of my videos. I love hearing from you and there will be plenty more to come. All right, bye guys. Oh, 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 oh,